Welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 120. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and I'm joined by a rather influential chap, Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Mike. What a timeless amount of weather we have here right now in Sydney, right? How soggy is it outside? It's quite ridiculous, but it might be raining on the outside, but we got a whole lot of good stuff going on inside the Moonshots podcast, don't we? Oh, we really, really do. Just to set the scene for our listeners again, recently we finished our leadership series where we had four modern day powerhouses, all coming from slightly different sectors, but all of whom had a consistent thread that inspired us to be great, great leaders. And last week, Mike, we began our Timeless Classic series with Dale Carnegie's uh, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. And this week, core, we have the next, uh, probably maybe even more well-known book of Dale Carnegie's, which is How to Win Friends and Influence People. What a two-hander to begin our Timeless Classic series. Oh my gosh. I mean, two big ones from, from Dale there. And I mean, just to show you how off the charts this book is, so Dale passed in the in the 1950s and his book on Amazon has like 40,000 reviews and he's like an average of almost 5 out of 5 stars. This is a epic uh piece of work. Now interestingly, I would say to you Mark that it sound it runs the risk of sounding a little bit cheesy like winning friends influencing people it doesn't quite gel with the modern age but i want to uh you know appeal to you and our listeners mark that it is worth sticking with us on this one because if you enjoyed how to stop worrying and start living this one really jumps off into okay you've set yourself in a good place On the inside with your intrinsic setup, you know, you've got the right mindset for yourself. That's what we got out of last week's show. This week's show is, okay, jump out into the world and connect and work with others. And I would say to you, Mark, the essential nature of this book and doing this show is that as Patrick Lencioni said, you know, life is a team sport. We're not all sitting in the ivory tower. So, Mark, how we connect with people, how we align with them, how we mobilize them, which is really in the essence what this book is about. I would say, Mark, that this is an essential skill of the modern age. Forget the timeless classics, forget the 1900s. I'm talking 2021, connecting with people, collaborating with people is of the essence. It got a bit harder with all of this you know, work from home and quarantine, but that's why this book matters right here right now. Just like when we were digging into how to stop worrying and start living, there were so many of those lessons, Mike, that stood out to me personally that got my mind racing and got me kind of excited to get out there and and try those pretty practical tips, actually, if you remember. And I think you're quite right. When we jump forward to where we are today, how to win friends and influence people, it's still full of those little tips that you and I can start doing and our mm. listeners can, mm. you know, hear us learning out loud from. So I'm I'm excited, Mike. Yeah. And I think the the fun thing that we're going to do together is we're going to put sort of a bit of a modern uh, taste, a little mo- modern angle to this, this great work. And uh, so what you can expect is we're going to have two big sections to the show. We're going to deal with the first uh, kind of step in his process, and it's about empathy. It's about just understanding the person that you're talking to, being frankly just a bit interested in them. Let's let's get to that point. And then once we've had that, that sort of understanding, that empathy, that connection, then it's all about well, how do we need to align with them? And that's going to be the second half of the show. And this is essential thinking because this is how you get people on board for your idea, for your vision of where you want the team, the business, the organization to go. So that's why it is so important. We've got these two big blocks. There's going to be plenty of practical tips. So much is in there, but how lucky are we? One of the, someone that we have studied on this show Mr. Uh, Warren Buffett, the greatest investor of all time, even he has actually undergone the Dale Carnegie training based on this book. 
And so don't you think, Mark, it is so great that we can actually hear from somebody who we've studied on this show has actually used Dale Carnegie's thinking. And I think Warren's success sort of speaks for itself, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. You know, for those listeners who want to get back into our Warren Buffett episode, it was episode 44, actually, Mike. Hmm. And just to uh, kick off the show, you're right. Let's hear from the investor himself, Mr. Warren Buffett, praising Dale Carnegie's training on how to win friends and influence people. Somebody once said that the chains of habit are too light to be felt until they're too heavy to be broken. I had been terrified of public speaking. I couldn't do it. I'd throw up. And I knew if I didn't cure it then, I'd never cure it. And so I so I added the paper to the Dale Carnegie course, which worked on developing your ability to speak in public. And I went down there. Be sincere. A good smile has the same effect as a puppy's tail. They made us do all these crazy things to get out of ourselves, and so we stood on tables and did all kinds of things. If I hadn't have done that, my whole life would have been different. So in my office, you will not see the degree I got from the University of Nebraska. You'll not see the master's degree I got from Columbia University, but you'll see the little award certificate I got from the Dale Carnegie course. What I, well, isn't that just so fun? Just to hear um, Warren Buffett say, "Oh, I was petrified of of public speaking." This is somebody that you know when he turns up on CNBC, like the ratings go through the truth. He's the sage of Omaha. Yes, Warren Buffett had to work on himself, and he used Dale Carnegie's thinking, and that's what we're doing right now, Mark. For you, for me, for all of our listeners, this is just about understanding that. We need to go out and show the best version of ourselves to the world. We cannot be some recluse in a tower and assume that it's all going to come together. The world by design is social. Social means peers, colleagues, friends, people that you need to bring along with you. Now, to add a little bit of extra context, we've got another clip here where uh, the guys from Productivity Game are talking about like, why is this all so popular and uh, they've got some fresh thinking on why you need to surround yourself with friends. Did you know that having fewer friends as you get older is more dangerous than being obese or smoking 15 cigarettes a day? Did you know that having a best friend at work can make you seven times more engaged and productive? But regardless of the latest science on friendship, wouldn't it just be nice to be surrounded by colleagues and customers that you can call your friends? Rather than being surrounded by a group of people you suspect are talking behind your back and finding ways to sabotage your success? Wouldn't it be nice to have a network of professional friends you could rely on when your career doesn't go according to plan and you're looking for a new opportunity? Well, luckily, all the tools you need to build solid friendships, strengthen your network, and make people eager to help you throughout your career can be found in an 80-year-old book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. The principles in this book are as applicable today as they were when the book was published in 1936. And you can be sure that the principles in this book will be used by your kids and your grandkids when they try to win friends and influence people. I mean, what a great two-hander of intro clips there, Mike. Really setting the scene for us as we dig into Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People to uh, totally different sources, Warren Buffett, as well as the Productivity Game guys, um, but both such huge advocates for the the principles, mm. the 27 principles of how to win friends and influence people and the value that, that we can have. You know, for me, that first clip from Warren, as you pointed out, it's about confidence, getting out of uh, your own head mm -hmm. and getting in front of people, being confident. And, you know, Warren Buffett's now uh, considered the best investor in the world. But as he said, oh, I, I lacked a little bit of confidence and look where he is now. Then when you jump into that productivity game clip, Surrounding yourself with people that you want to work with that make your life that little bit right. nicer. I mean, haven't we all uh, at some point in our careers thought, oh, is this, is this kind of what I want? Is, is so-and-so really making me that happy? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the reality is, I mean, you don't have to be besties with everybody you work with. 
but they got to be nice. You want to surround yourself with people that are sociable, that are you know fair, that are good listeners, that are contribute, like just good people, right? Mm-hmm. And um, the the law here is that you know you need to put your best uh, version of yourself out there if you want to attract the right people. I mean, to play this on the inverse, you know when someone is really morbid and always think the worst is going to happen is always negative. What you notice about them is nobody wants them on the project, right? Because they're just like Darth Vader, doom and gloom. It's just like, oh, here they come, all negative, talking it down, this downward spiral of negativity. Nobody wants to hang out with those kind of people. So the truth here is you've got to be open to connecting with others. Show the best version of yourself. You've just got to make a little bit of effort. I think this is the big thing. Like you've got to make a bit of effort. You've got to put down your phone, look them in the eye, really be engaged, use good body language because the benefit of this is it is a signal to them that you respect and understand them and they will then offer the same to you. So, Mark, what I pitch to you, this is a small pace to price, a uh, small pace price to pay. Jeez, that one really you know, was hard <laughs> to get it. It's a very small price for us to pay in order to build a connection with someone, isn't it? It's just make a little effort, you know, get out of your own ego and say, you know what, I'm really going to listen to what they have to say to me. I'm going to present my best self so they give me the best of them. And then it's a mutual win-win. I mean, to me, this is at the essence of this book by Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence Them. Yeah. And I think that was something that stood out to me as, as we'll go through the rest of the show is a reminder that not only do I request that the people that I work with are, are doing this for me. I, I want them to kind of make my life good, but at the same time, I've got to make their life good, you know, by, by being, uh, I don't know, maybe it's grumpy or quiet or whatever it might be. I'm in fact, I think the, the book reminds me that I'm influencing uh, and impacting other people's lives at the same time. So it's yeah. kind of like a call to action on, uh, both sides, you know, for those who I'm collaborating with as well as myself, mm. how can I improve the the working relationship of others as well? What do you think uh, as human beings we all make the mistake of when we're working with others? What do we kind of, if, if we hadn't read Dale Carnegie's book, what are the common mistakes you think people make, it, it, particularly in the office when they're trying to collaborate with others? What do you think they the mistake they do when they're trying to surround themselves with friends, but their behaviors don't align with that. What, what would be like a common thing that you see? Um, I think a common behavior in the office might be, you, you, I think we've all worked with people who have the bravado or the overconfidence mm. and therefore they're really loud. They're on the phone a lot. They're quite salesy perhaps in that mm. sort of um, uh, maybe overused word, and they 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 kind of think, okay, well, I am confident, therefore everybody likes me. But actually, the inverse happens for those who are a little bit maybe introverted. It becomes a little bit jarring. So mm. an overconfidence, an assumption that my ego is correct for this big team, sometimes has the adverse effect. And I think what came through in in this book is, okay, well, you know, almost check yourself. Check yourself totally. when you when you're trying to stop worrying and, and live life in the in episode one nineteen. In this one, it's okay, well now check yourself with how you collaborate with others, how you align with them, mm. how you work with them. I would say, you know, another thing that I see is people not demonstrating any genuine fascination or interest in the people that they work with. So you know when people just say, hey, hey, doing? yeah, good. How was your weekend? Yeah, good. And then that's it. Mm. It's like, well, okay, what are you doing? Oh, you're a chef. What do you like to cook? Like, tell me. Like, for me, I, I mean, I'm just kind of a curious person, I guess, but but I, I often see the absence of any interest in 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 people as being a really common thing. And, and I think some people are a bit shy to ask. Some people forget to go, hang on a second and just say, hey, how are you? Hey, how's your weekend? You know, instead of doing that, just go, 
actually, how are you? I noticed you didn't come in several times last week. Are you okay? Mm. Like just that little effort will help, you know, connect you with people. But I think we have to remember that we're all humans. Humans are social and we need to have that uh, fundamental desire to connect with the world around us, with the people with whom we engage, if you really want to enjoy work, because so much of work is the interaction with others. It's not just the functional work, it's the behavioral piece. It's it's the, the, the coffee break, it's the celebrations, it's overcoming adversity together. It's all these things that it's not just, you know, the specific functional uh, thing that you may do. And, and, and I would take it just one step further, which is also for your customers. You know, sometimes right. the, the customers, clients that you work with, I mean, I, I challenge our listeners to think about the best relationships or the best projects, the best clients, customers, and so on that they have and ask yourselves, okay, well, am I genuinely interested in what that person does? Mm-hmm. Do we have uh, exactly the conversation, Mike, that you've just said, oh, you're a chef. Tell us, what do you mm-hmm. cook? Mm-hmm. Because- in my experience, the most pleasant projects when I felt aligned and I felt happy with um, uh, customers and, and so on are the relation are the times when a relationship exists between us, where we have that great connection, that communication, that interest in what one another is doing. What's what's so perfect about what you're saying is we're really just talking about having empathy for those around you. Stop thinking about yourself and all your interests. Have empathy for those around you. And we've got a great clip now uh, from Clark Kegley, who we're going to feature a fair bit on this show. And he's going to talk about how you can open doors. Become interesting by being interested. So good. If you just remember one thing from this video, if you just become genuinely interested in the other person, man, all these doors open up. Who doesn't want to be around someone who's actually listening? People are craving for people to just shut up and listen. There's nothing worse, right? When you're out with friends and you're in the middle of a story and they're doing this, uh uh-huh, uh-huh. And then what do they do? They reach and they pick up their phone. Man, if that just isn't a giant middle finger, I don't know what is, right? That sucks. Why do people pay hundreds of dollars an hour to sit down and talk to therapists? A lot of times, yeah, they're trained, they can coach you through things, but a lot of times if you survey people of why they're doing it, they love that unconditional listening right there. So if you just go into interactions and you say, hey, I'm just here to listen, like I'm just gonna commit to listening and being interested in people, instead of trying to be significant and oh yeah, well one time I did that too, you're gonna get more people to like you because it's it's a weird thing. When you talk less and you just ask more questions, um, people open up more, they trust you more, and they feel like they know you more. Oh, such a great principle that comes from Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, Mike. It's so true. And look, I'm going to be honest, I've probably fallen into the trap of bouncing on what somebody said and immediately start talking about myself. Mm. And I'm going to have to check myself there Mm. because there's nothing more frustrating (laughs) than when you're on a roll, you're talking about maybe your weekend, whatever it is, and then suddenly the conversation gets uh, sidetracked onto yeah. somebody else. You know, it is, it, it's, it's not something that um, would ruin my day, but it is going to be something that will jar with me and it'll instantly create that little bit of uh, maybe negativity even. And by being interested, by listening to one another is exactly what you and I were just discussing. It's creating that empathy, isn't it, between two people that can only increase the productivity or the at least the enjoyment of a particular project. Yeah, so interesting thing uh, for me um, when you were, you know, talking uh, just then was, okay, how do we go into this a bit more and ask ourselves, well, how do you, you know, become genuinely interested? How do you create that flow of conversation? So I want to share with you a little thing that I find really helpful um, when I'm really interested in someone and I feel like there's a real desire for me to connect with them. 
Perhaps I haven't seen them for a while. Perhaps I know we're going to be working together or we're about to do a big session. So I really need to like connect, have that connection before we get into the subject matter itself. And uh, one of the things um, that I do is when someone says, okay, I've been, I've been working on a book. Um, now, normally, if you weren't using the Dale Carnegie approach, you'd say, oh, okay, cool. Uh, and what else have you been doing? But if you use Dale Carnegie's approach, you would say, oh, a book, gee, what's that like? Because, you know, I, you know, I would guess that's pretty hard stuff. And they'll be like, oh, tell me about it. It's so hard. I have to get up at five o'clock. And really, how do you find the motivation to get up at five o'clock? Well, I use this technique. Really? Oh, where do I get this thing? Oh, okay. And how did you find it? Well, and what you can see that I'm doing here is following a pathway of conversation that's interested. And it's, for me, it's this idea of just going to the second level. When someone tells you, hey, I'm running a... Uh, uh, a triathlon, for example. Oh, really? Okay. Um, well, how are you going to approach that? Like, do you feel like you're ready? What have you been training like? Uh, what are your goals for this? Like, it's just going beyond. And don't you think a lot of conversation only is surface level at level one, Mark? Don't you experience that? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Without going down into that level two, it kind of feels as though it's a little bit flat, doesn't it? You, you don't really warm up into it you don't really make that that connection without mm. having that level two as you put it deep dive understanding and actual you know fundamentally it's interest yeah so you showcase that interest if someone tells you here's what i'm doing just use the very simple framework well how did you do it and why yeah that, you- i mean there's a good hour conversation a couple of coffees a croissant i mean that is a great conversation right there if someone says you know what um Mike, I am learning to do belly dancing. <laughs> and then I'd be like, well, how on earth do you do that? Where do you start with belly dancing, right? And then like order your coffees, you're off to the races. Yeah, you with that demonstration of active listening, yeah. that level two, yeah, you become less guarded. I think that's the key word mm-hmm. here, isn't it? The individuals become less guarded and therefore are going to be more open to 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 continue chatting and by the way listeners what mike's referring to there is my new hobby of uh, picking up belly dancing (laughs) (laughs) but so the thing is i think there's a lot of clues in conversation which help you be genuinely interested and uh you know the classic thing is someone says oh i went mountain biking on the weekend really where is it risky like i see a lot of people falling off like how do you feel about that and uh, is this part of like a fitness thing or is it more like a family thing, just like getting out and about? Like this to me, that genuine interest is asking when they tell you what's happening, well, how, tell me how you do that and why do you do that? And you just keep following up with the whys and the hows and you just get an amazing story arc and you will actually, here's the thing, maybe in the beginning you have to kind of force this interest, but actually people are fascinating things. So there's always a great story uh, in someone. So don't don't for a minute think that it's always going to be hard work. What you will find is this great conversational flow. And once you've had that empathy, once you've got that foundational uh, connection, Mark, I think you can go on and do great things, don't you? Yeah, I think once you've found that, that common ground, um, between you, once you become less guarded and are quite happy to have that conversation going forward, it becomes a lot um, nicer, I, I guess is, is one simple way of putting it. But also you've got a lot of opportunity to learn from that person. You know, I remember Lencioni would, would tell us the active listening, being the uh, perhaps the quietest person and absorbing the information from those around you is, is one way to really excel your, your skills as well as your collaboration. But this next clip, Mike, within the idea of having empathy for one another is building on this common ground. And again, it's, it's our friend Clark Kegley telling us a little bit about um, finding this common ground, but also taking it one step further and finding out a way to get people to say yes. This is an old school persuasion trick, okay? When you get people to say yes to a small task, they're much more likely to say yes to a bigger task. What I just gave you right there is some marketing gold. Okay, you ever seen um, a seminar and it's kind of cheesy, ever the, the guy on stage is speaking, he's like, who here, who here wants to make more money? 
everyone puts their hand up. It's like, who's going to disagree with that? So why is he asking that question? It's this. To get people to say yes, so then later when he introduces some other ideas that maybe they disagree with or he asks them to do something, they're more likely to say yes to that bigger task. They stair-step their way up. This makes sense? Okay? This is also known as like a trial close. If you get people to say yes and kind of nod and say stuff in their head, it's the same thing. So you'll see Tony Robbins doing this, right? It'll be, say I, and then you say I, so you identify with it. It's another form of saying yes. Or Jordan Belfort's a great public speaker, he says this. True or true? Yes or yes? Right? So it can get a little cheesy, but you want them to say yes. So an easy way for you to apply this is if you're getting in an argument, which is the chapter the book's from, instead of starting an argument with you're over here and they're over here and it's you versus them and you're butting heads, come to common grounds and agree on something. Okay, so if you're in a political argument, you could say, look, we, we all agree that we do care about people regardless of immigration laws, right? And then boom, that starts it on a peaceful manner and you can, you know, diverge from there. Uh, this is really good. Now, I do want to say, you know, Clark was getting a little on the uh, sort of Jordan Belfort salesy vibe. There. <laughs> so I want to pull it back a little bit, like calm down, Clark. Um the thing here is he's just saying is if you if you really want to connect, uh, maybe there are specific things that you can't agree on, but you can always go back to first principles. That's that's what he's really doing here, which is a big part of Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence Them. Because like there would like let's say Mark, you and I are in violent agreement as to whether you should do belly dancing or not. And um, in the end, I I think we would to use these, um, this idea of common ground, we'd say, well, look, first of all, you and I are both human beings. Would you agree? And you'd be like, yeah, good. And we both agree that humans need exercise. Uh, they need to be active. Yeah, we can both agree. And then later in that conversation, there might be very, very niche details of whether your VO2 max levels are sufficiently high enough when belly dancing. We might disagree there. But the point here is building common ground, if you want to connect with someone, is really important for the second half of our show, which is all about how to get alignment, connection, how to get people inspired and mobilized around your idea. This is the prerequisite. This is like the groundwork that you need to lay in order for people to come to you, for you guys to meet in the middle and to feel that Yep, we got a strong common ground. So we know that we can go and explore lots of topics and we can always return to the common ground if we're in violent disagreement. Does that make sense? Yeah, finding that common ground straight off the bat is, it reminds me of negotiation techniques, Mike. You know, um, we haven't covered Chris Voss on, on Moonshots yet. Uh, one of our listeners did make that suggestion actually. So we'll have to put Chris on the, uh, on the long mm. list. But uh, it does remind me of one of the, lessons from from Chris Voss's experience, which is you don't necessarily have to agree on, um, you know, the output straight away, but if you can under create a common thread between the two parties right at the very beginning, okay, right, we both agree belly dancing is what Mark should do. Okay, now let's, let's move on from there. You know, creating that initial connection, I think, is what's really coming through in, in Clark calling out the, uh, that principle from Dale Carnegie. Uh, because once you've created that, you can then build on that foundation a lot easier, can't you? You can. And, and I think there's another idea here. This is not just when you're, you know, quote unquote, trying to sell something. I would say that, look, if you and your partner are trying to agree um, about what to do on the weekend together, you would use exactly the same approach. Now, we both agree that we really want to get out of the city for the weekend. All right. Now, I don't want to go to the belly dancing retreat up in the North Coast. I would rather go to the South Coast and do a bike ride. We, this is where we disagree, but we both agree we want to get out of the city. So this is no different whether you're uh, discussing it with friends or partners, family, business colleagues. It's not just about the art of the sale here. This is just about getting connected and getting aligned so we can go do things together because that's what humans do. And I know I'm really trying very hard to bring this around because I think if we can um, go beyond that, this is just, uh, this is not only a way 
to sell. This is the way to collaborate with each other. You know, you have to have that empathy. You have to then, you know, explore the common ground, get the empathy flowing. So then you can get onto agreeing about let's go do something together because humans are collaborative. So this for me is why this book is so powerful. What do you think, Matt? Yep. This collaboration is exactly what can build on uh, once you've received that that or created that empathy, Mike. And I'm quite excited to get into the second half of our show where we're going to dig into that a little bit further, aren't we? Yeah. So coming up later in the show, what we're going to do is then go, okay, so you've got that basic underlying connection and foundation. Great. Now what we need to do is talk specifically about what maybe you and I, Mark, are going to do. That is a new level of techniques and skills, and it can really unlock so much goodness because when people get together, I believe good things happen. And that's why this book is is so important. But before we go to the second half of the show and unlock all that alignment and, and getting people mobilized, I'll tell you who's mobilized, and that's the uh, the Moonshots listeners, haven't they, Mark? Yeah, I tell you what, l- listeners, uh, thank you so much for getting in touch. We've had one of our most active weeks in, in recent memory, I think. We've had people from all over the world getting in touch, raising awareness and and giving us recommendations, actually, Mike. You know, a couple of special shout outs to AI Squirrel in Germany. Uh, again, following the plea that I think we had in last week's episode for listeners to get in touch with unusual uh, profile handles. I'm so pleased that AI Squirrel has reached out to say that they uh, they appreciate the work. That's fantastic. Do you AI think, Squirrel in Germany, high five to you guys. Do, do you think, Mark, we need to run a competition for the best user handle of all moonshotters? Because, I mean, we've got dragons on wheels. We've got an AI-driven squirrel. Could you imagine a squirrel using artificial intelligence? That is just like that's mind bending, right? It now. sounds like a project for 2021, Mike. It does. It does. <laughs> I'm not sure of the results, but uh, if it, if it ends up in more reviews for Moonshots, I'm all good. <laughs> We've also had a listener get in touch via LinkedIn, has haven't we, Mike? Mr. Terry Bean. Thank you so much again, Terry, for uh, giving us a couple of great suggestions that are now on our on our long list. Um, but also, we had a great listener get in touch via our Moonshots survey, mm. via our feedback form. So you can see listeners are getting in touch by all of the different parameters and the different media touch points of our of our show and the external factors. So listeners, just to reiterate, we really do appreciate you guys getting in touch. No matter what means, it all gets to us, whether it's email, review, LinkedIn, or via our SurveyMonkey feedback form on www.moonshots.com moonshots.io. And if you are to navigate over to moonshots.io, you can not only find a great way of getting in touch with us and leaving us your thoughts, but also we have a little bit of a special request, don't we, Mike, which is to keep these recommendations of innovators, entrepreneurs, authors, and leaders coming. We love getting a, a number of different, un, sometimes unusual, and people that we haven't necessarily run into before. Yeah, recommendations of who we should follow next. Well, we got a, we got a great uh, couple from from Terry who suggested Bob Berg and Dan Millman, and frankly, I, I hadn't heard of them. So great suggestions. They're now on the future shows list on moonshots.io. So, folks, send us your suggestions because we are a listener, aren't we, Mark? We are always listening, like like you guys listen to us learning out loud. We are listening to you. Tell us who you want us to learn out loud from. We've got authors, we've got entrepreneurs, business titans, and all sorts of tycoons around the world. Everybody that you want us to dig into, send your thoughts over via www.moonshots.io or to hello at moonshots.io, and we will make sure to give it a listen, give it a read, add it to our long list. Yeah. So uh, much of our success on this show depends on your contribution. So we're deeply grateful for everything that you send us that helps us make a better show, helps us learn out loud. Because frankly, that's what we're doing here on the Moonshots podcast. We're looking at innovators and entrepreneurs and we're just breaking it down together. We're asking ourselves, how might we do it too? And that's pretty fun, isn't it, Mark? 
It's pretty fun. It's pretty fun, Mike. Uh, we we have fun, whether it's uh, talking about belly dancing or, or business ideas. You know, I, I enjoy the the process. Right. Uh, as as I can feel that there is a belly dancing class coming upon us here in Sydney, Australia, very very soon. I'm going to quickly diverge our interest and attention uh, to the second half of the show, Mike. We've we've done the empathy and connection piece. I feel like now is the time for us to look at how do we create this alignment? How do we get people collaborating with us? How do we get them to join the cause? Exactly. So this next uh, place that we're going to, we've heard about being interested in others and listening, active listening and going to level two. We've heard about finding that common ground and really building on this empathy. It's now using that to really align with one another. And this next clip from the Achieving Concepts crew they're going to tell us a little bit about how to think about what the other person wants, but also to arouse an eager want in others. Carnegie opens up the concept saying that he frequently fished in Maine during the summer. He says that he's personally fond of berries and cream, but for some strange reason, the fish like worms. And he went into detail saying that he doesn't bait his hook with strawberry and cream, he baits it with worms, because fish like worms. He doesn't think about what he wants, he thinks about what the fish want. And really, in summation, he baits the hook to suit the fish. If you were to be a personal trainer, you're not going to look for clients and say, hey, I want to build a customer base as your sales pitch. You're going to say, hey, I want to help you lose weight, and I'm going to do that in a personalized manner. I'm going to struggle with you, I'm going to sweat with you, I'm going to be there for you, I'm going to fight with you, and we are going to lose weight together. The key to this concept is really putting yourself in another person's perspective, seeing through their eyes, seeing what they want, and learning how to align what they want with what it is that you want. Sure, this is going to take some creativity in aligning what you want with the receiving parties' wants and desires, but always remember you have to construct it through their needs. You have to make it an eager want for them, or else it's not going to be effective. Because the point is, is they just don't care what you want. And that's the principle of arousing in the other person an eager want. When... I hear this clip, Mark. I just think about all the companies that go and launch products into the world that are obviously so self-centered. Look at what we can do in our product rather than look at all the problems that you have that we might be able to solve. To me, this is such a great example of this paradigm playing out where people are too obsessed about themselves rather than understanding things from the point of view of what the other person actually wants and needs. Yeah, yeah, it's true where Dale Carnegie is coming from that we should really consider what the fish wants. Let's see and think as the other party, whether that's you and I collaborating, whether it's us working with another customer to build a product, or in exactly in the case that you've just said, Mike, when you're building a product for the customer, don't just guess that they're going to want the same thing that you do because invariably they probably won't. Go and use some methodologies and practices and processes to actually go and ask them. Yeah, and I would say they may even want the same outcome or they may even want a feature of your product or they might want your project, but how you do it and why they want it might be wildly different. So we often assume not only that people want to do something together to collaborate on a project, but we then assume how and why as per our own bias. But they may, in fact, do, want to participate in the belly dancing classes, but for totally different reasons. And I think here it is always start from what are the, the pain relievers, what are the gain creators that the person that you're talking to, the person you want to invite them to collaborate with you, to join with you in some way. Well, think 
about the world as if you were walking in their shoes and start through identifying the pains that they experience and the things that they're actually looking for and then work your way through, okay, well, let's see what might relieve those pains. If you want them to be eager to join, to collaborate with you, start by thinking about them. It's so good, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, it, it, it really, for me, when I imagine actively doing this, I immediately go back to that first block of, of uh, lessons and principles that we were learning um, earlier in the show, Mike, about being interested in what the other person is saying, listening, finding that common ground. Because I believe that for me to uh, put myself in the squirrel's shoes or the fish or <laughs> the AI squirrel shoes, I've got to understand and be on that same page. And I think that it just demonstrates this whole uh, tapestry, this whole set of lessons and principles and how they're all interconnected within how to win friends and influence people whereby we're shown how to think about what the other person mm. wants. So to mm. get to this point where we can find the eager want and to provide a product or a concept or, or, or a test even to a, a customer or a user or whoever it might be, we kind of need to take that first set of lessons, don't we? We need to think, we need to listen, we need to find that that empathy. Yeah, and I think there's like, some good techniques you can do to understand the person in front of you. I mean, if you're, if you're in such a, a relationship with someone, you can even um, start by under, uh, you know, fundamentally understanding them. Mark, something you and I often get people to do is to do the uh, 16personalities.com test, which gives you an archetype which describes in general kind of your, your, your general type of person that you are. I find that really helpful if, uh, and getting to understand people. So if I want to un al align with them and get them to join something, I understand if they're more of a sentinel or if they're more of a collaborator or whether they're more of an analysis type of person. I mean, it's pretty powerful stuff when you use those tools, right? There's some pretty great tests and online uh, tools just like that one, isn't there? And they're really, really handy because they do – deliver what I think we're starting to uncover within Dale Carnegie's book and principles. You know, these foundational pieces of DNA to understand how we can collaborate better and how other people uh, react and, and, and respond to things. Mm. Some of those tests that you're calling out, like the 16 personalities one, it kind of helps you along that way, I think. It, it kind of provides, yes. oh, here's a little bit of information about this type, this trait. Yeah, and and so so if you were to say, look, I'm I'm really want Mark to join me on this belly dancing uh, training session. I don't know how we got to belly dancing. I don't know. <laughs> it's, just, it's just so random. But okay, so so you know, the, there's another um, framework that you can use here. It's the the value pyramid, and uh, it's a little bit based on Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. But what you could do is you could say. Um, really address the question of why. Why do, do you want to do a pro, uh, project together? Um, and it might be a functional benefit. Uh, maybe it makes money. Maybe it organizes things. Maybe it, um, you know, reduces some hassles on something, saves time. So that's very functional reasons why we would collaborate. But then you've got some more emotional areas in this value pyramid. And so you go from functional up to emotional. Maybe there's wellness. Maybe there's fun. Maybe there's some status. Maybe there's calm and reduction of anxiety. These are more emotional reasons why we would do something together. Then you get right to the top of this pyramid and then you get into some life-changing ideas like hope, motivation, affiliation. Those are ways in which you can uh, really understand the other person and talk about arousing a want once you are ticking these boxes and you get right up to the very top, which is social impact and, and self-transcendence, self-transformation. If you can plot the map on the person that you're talking to and to understand the functional, emotional, life-changing reasons why, then it becomes very easy to present 
your idea to someone because if it truly is a good fit for them, you will be ticking each of those boxes in the value pyramid. Um, you could use the, the the circles of why from Simon Sinek. Here's what, how, and why we're going to collaborate together. So these are all ways in which you can arouse the eager want to get that alignment, to rally them to that cause. Because, hey, if I'm like, yeah, I want that wellness. Yes, I want that fun and entertainment. I want the sensory experience. I want uh, the affiliation of belonging into a group. Whatever it is, that's when you're talking their language. And you've only got there because you started with the empathy. But this is now the framework by which you can really connect with someone and with that connection, you can rally them to a cause, get them to collaborate with you, which I believe is a very modern uh, prerequisite to success. Don't you, Matt? Yeah, I think you're right. It's very, we, we can't nowadays uh, in, in type of business uh, and communication lines that now exist you can't really collaborate that well without having that empathy, without having good communication, can you? You need to almost go back to the basics. You need to figure out how to have those good conversations, communication, in order to create a, a product or even just a working style that's really, really valuable, beneficial, and also quite pleasant. <laughs> it is. But, you know, Mark, we have to be honest. Um Work is not always pleasant, is it? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Sometimes it just doesn't work. And the tendency that I think we all have, and we started to see this a little bit in some of our previous shows and calling up last week's How to Stop Worrying, mm. we were learning about how to compartmentalize, to react better when stresses, worries, anxieties get in our way and how to avoid pushing people away. And this next clip, Mike, Again, influenced by Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, is about exactly that. So we've gone back to Manny Vaya of the 2000 Books uh, show, and he's going to tell us a little bit about how to avoid this uh, tendency that you might have when things get difficult to push people away. And actually, one of the great tips and principles of Dale Carnegie's is how to remove resistance by actually agreeing first. Don't resist people. Agree first. Now let me tell you another story. In the early days of building 2000 books, when talking to potential customers, I'd get into heated arguments about why our book summaries and courses were better than our competitors. But that only led to the customer getting pushed away. They would argue their point about why they liked our competitors and dig into that argument. But now I have learned better, I have changed my ways. Now if the potential customer says, I will buy XYZ company book summaries, instead of getting into an argument, I say, oh yeah, XYZ company has some good stuff and they are made by good people. And that's the end of resistance. As soon as I agree that XYZ summaries are good, there is no more resistance from the potential customer. Now I can talk about the specific features and benefits of 2000 books, all the different information products we offer and why we are different, which often leads to the sale. So why does this work? Well, once you agree with the other person, they cannot continue to argue against you. And as a result, now you can talk about what you want to talk about. So really simple. Don't resist people. Agree first. Yeah, this one is is really interesting because I think that when we're presenting our ideas, we often fall in the trap of having when compared to other ideas, we we sort of devalue or talk down the other ideas. And one of my learnings has been, well, actually like who am I to to make cast dispersions? And actually, it's just ego just saying, oh, no, 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 look at my idea. It's good, it's good. The other one, bad, bad, bad. Me, good, good. But actually, what, what Manny is talking about there when perhaps you're talking to a colleague about, hey, I want you to join my project and they're weighing up two projects, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, the other project you're considering, I mean, I'm not on it, but you are, uh, you're considering that one. That, that is a really cool project. You know, and I guess the the if, if you're lacking awareness, you might be tempted to go, oh, that's a terrible project. You don't want to join that. But you can say, hey, that's a good choice. I like that. 
but I'd love the chance to make the case for my one. And if I know you, I think we're doing some pretty unique things here that would really, really uh, be cool for you to do. Would you be interested in talking about that? Mm. And then all of a sudden, you don't have to talk down others to raise yourself, right? I think that's the powerful idea here. I, th- I think it is ego, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's, it's Ron Hodley, ego is the enemy. Um, if, you, if you came to me, Mike, and you said, hey, Mark, check this out. I'm working on this kind of cool project. And my initial response was, man, it sounds rubbish. Count, count me out. I'm not interested. You know, <laughs> how jarring would that be as an experience? And ultimately, it's just down to my ego or my subjectivity that then it creates that resistance. And the truth mm. is, I don't know. I don't know the details or the background or the context or importantly, the challenge and solution. You know, it's uh, what, what I think it's such a great little lesson here because it, it again reminds us to check ourselves mm. to say, hang on, hold the phone before you react in a way that might be influenced by a bad email you just received, or maybe it's the weather or your coffee's cold, you know, external factors that fundamentally it doesn't need to impact the relationship that we might have. Instead, let's just agree and just say, okay, actually that's kind of cool, mate. Tell me more. Yeah. And then, you know, yeah. using those lessons we've, we've already talked about, that alignment then leads to better collaboration, doesn't it? Yeah, because also I think something else happens when someone is saying, oh, that thing's crap, you should take my one. Um, you know, there's almost, when it, when you really get into it, then you start subconsciously going, well, maybe yours is actually the bad one and the one yeah. that you're talking down is the good one. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I think that it's it's all about rising above the fray and just saying, you know what, there's some very good reasons to do that. I would like the chance to show you why maybe there are some unique reasons to do our one that I think might really work for you. And I clearly said, I'm different. I'm another option, but I didn't have to talk down the other party. And I think I've certainly um, fell victim to talking down and disagreeing or no, that's crap and trying to to, to fight those those kind of side scuffle arguments when it should be like, I think I'm in the search of fit. I've got a great idea. I think that could really fit you. I want to collaborate. You know, let's talk about what that could be. And there's no need to get into that little hand-to-hand combat, is there? No, because once you remove that hand-to-hand combat, it's no longer us versus them or me versus you, is it? Yeah. Suddenly it's it's going back to these this first principle of, uh, you know, surrounding yourself with people that you want to work with. Yeah. You know, if you're constantly battling with somebody and saying, hang on, but – it's not so bad. No, don't always fight me on this or that. Once you've kind of removed those barriers and there is better collaboration as well as this communication, it does just feel as though it's going to be much nicer. We can all have that breath of fresh air and say, you know what? I enjoy coming to work. I enjoy collaborating with so-and-so because they listen to me. They don't shoot down my ideas. They don't have, they don't let ego and subjectivity Mm. get in the way. Mm. Yeah, very good. I mean, these are almost these rules of, you know, getting into the shoes of the other person and thinking about what they really want, agreeing um, at first rather than resisting and fighting. Whilst some might say they're kind of salesy tactics, they're also good rules of engagement when you're trying to collaborate with someone. When you say, let's go out and do something, people might be like, I like the I agree, but I totally disagree with how you're going about it. Really? Okay. That's great because, you know, if we can discuss that, maybe th- the approach can be even better. Like that's a really good way to take that on board. And there's some very interesting moments here now where you see that Dale Carnegie's work also connects with a growth mindset. It also connects with some of the themes that we're seeing across all of the innovators, which is learning right? And you're not going to be learning. You're not going to be creative when you're fighting and arguing small points. Go out, find great ideas, share them with the right people. And you might not get everyone on the the collaboration wagon, right, Mark? I mean, maybe this is not a fit. Sometimes there's not a fit. Sometimes it doesn't work, but that doesn't need to be a reason 
for the the bath water to get thrown out, right? <laughs> We've got you know? bath water, hand to hand combat. I know the metaphors that we're using here right now is off the charts. Yeah, I hope I hope the listeners are keeping up. But it's <sighs> but it's true, isn't it? These fundamental techniques that were, were in Dale's book from 1936. Oh my gosh! And he's got one more, at least for this show, one more goodie, doesn't he? He does. Actually, this one's kind of an interesting one, Mike. This is a little bit of like an Easter egg, as they say. So this is Manny Vaya again. He's actually stepping outside and, and above all of the principles within Dale's book. And actually, he thinks he's found what he's referring to as the meta level uh, principle of the book, which I actually think is a great way to end the show. So this is Ma uh, Manny Vaya one more time talking about Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Now let's talk about the biggest idea from the book. And I think this is a secret idea because Dale Carnegie did not point it out as a separate law or rule or chapter in the book at all. But this idea in some ways is the meta level principle. It is the foundation of this whole book. And without this principle, none of the ideas from this book will work. So what's this idea? Well, it is a paradox. So here it is. If you want people to like you, you must like them first. Only when you genuinely like the other person will you be able to make friends with them, inspire them, motivate them, influence them, and lead them. However, if you don't genuinely like the other person, none of these ideas will actually work for you. You will constantly feel frustrated. Now you have to understand that it is a paradox. If you want others to like you, you must first like them. And it must be genuine. You see, when it comes to liking others, it is a matter of the heart. You can never fake liking others because others will always see right through it. So when you are trying to win friends and influence people, realize that it all begins with genuinely liking them. Mm. See, for me, what is really interesting, I'm going to go meta once again here, Mark. Are you <laughs> ready? Are you ready? I'm excited. I'm excited. Okay, okay. okay. So I believe that if you hold the truth that there is goodness in everyone, then you can find ways to appreciate and value each individual that you're coming into contact with. You don't have to be besties with them all, but you actually can find goodness in almost everyone. And that goodness is a way for you to genuinely be interested this is a way for you to genuinely get to, yes, to talk about something, a potential collaboration that they might be very eager to participate in. And by reminding yourself of the good things in that individual will give you the, the safety and the confidence to agree at first, don't always resist, and look for the match for the right person to collaborate with. So I think that's the meta meta is that in the end, there is goodness in everyone. And you, that's how you can get to genuinely um, feeling good about the people that you're working with. Yeah, I, th I think that's the core of a lot of this Timeless Classic series, Mike. We're really digging into that foundational uh, understanding of not only ourselves, but also a reminder to understand others. And what invariably comes up, uh, as we've seen today, about stop worrying as well, is when you do break it down into those core blocks, we're all people. We're all individuals who might have our own challenges, worries, concerns, mm. anxieties. And when we do take a moment to remember and have empathy for that individual that we might be sitting alongside, or in fact, looking down a Zoom camera and, and having a chat, as long as you can place yourself uh, like the fish and think about what you're, what you're going to be uh, to giving them and serving them. You know, I think that's such a valuable lesson. That's timeless. Now, interesting thing, talking about valuable lessons, Mark, is I am struggling on this show to pick the one idea that I think resonated with you the most. So I'm going to take a wild guess and say that you liked – the most, the the thoughts that we got from Clark Kegley uh, around the genuine interest in getting people to yes and the common ground thinking, did that did that stand out for you or am I just totally on the wrong track? You, you nailed it. You nailed it. So building on the uh, the productivity game, so clip two that we had about yeah. surrounding yourself with people that you like, uh, also people that you uh, want to work with. 
it's exactly that. So the Clark Higley um, call outs that he makes around being interested in people, getting that common ground, that's exactly the connection that I that I love because it's what makes all of our days just that a little bit more enjoyable. Mm. What about you, Mike? Where did you land? Hmm. I I would say that you know this idea of don't go for the hand to hand combat on on ideas confirm and agree with those the the things that are true in the common ground uh, so you remove the the resistance i think that was a very good reminder for me like yeah no i understand that that was those are good ideas those are valid ideas yes but give me the chance to picture this idea. Like, so, so I think that was actually a very timely reminder on when, you know, you're trying to negotiate perhaps abstract things like a big product idea or a vision or a strategy or something like this. I think uh, creating that, uh, that resistance removal is a very timely, very good advice. And isn't it so good to go back to a classic mark and just dig it up and go, wow, there's so much inside of this. And it's like, what did we say the publishing date was? Was it 1930s? 36. Yeah, yeah. 36. Holy <laughs> smoke. Isn't that amazing that there is so much goodness in it? There's so much goodness, so many tips that we can still learn from and that are still influencing the leaders and the collaborators all around us, the entrepreneurs that we learn out loud from, Mike. It just feels so instrumental and at the core of a lot of the great stuff that we do. Really does. It really, really does. Well, um, stay tuned, Mark, and stay tuned to you, our listeners, because next week we will be going to an equal heavyweight. Well, I don't know if it's equal, who knows, but it's uh, going to be the territory of habits, which is a big moonshots theme. And I know you, our moonshotters, love habits, love rituals. So we're going to go to the master of them, Stephen Covey, and the seven habits of highly effective people. Oh, oh. that one is Going to be good, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, that's going to be a great one. And you're right. It's going to be a, a fantastic alignment with a lot of the interests of you, our listeners. Yes. And at this point in time, the only thing left to do, Mark, is to say thank you. Thank you to you, Mark, because, boy, we dug up and we polished a classic together today. And I want to say thank you to you, our listeners, the moonshotters who just love to learn out loud, to join us on this adventure into innovation, this adventure into entrepreneurship. And today we study Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And the winning with friends was all about empathy and connection. And the influence was all about alignment and collaboration. And why should we be studying such an old book? Well, if it worked for Warren Buffett, if it helped him become the best version of himself, well, then that's certainly something that we can learn from. And it started with surrounding ourselves with people that we like. So how do you do that? Well, you connect. And connection is all about starting with being genuinely interested in others and work hard and diligently to find the common ground because that is how you get to yes. And when you're collaborating, when you have a big dream and you need to bring people along with you, if you want them to get on board, if you want them to get on the bus, you have to think about what the other person wants. And then you can actually remove the resistance by agreeing and taking the conversation to another level. And the other level is in the end, you need to have genuine feelings if you want to connect and collaborate with others. And that's what we learned today here with the dive into the world in the work of Dale Carnegie. So if you believe in the goodness of humanity and you can find genuine feelings for the people you work with, you will truly be the best, the very best version of yourself. And that's what we're all about here at the Moonshots Podcast. That's a wrap.